The Insignificant Twelve, Part 7. Matthew, the tax collector, and Thomas, the loyal. I know some of you were waiting for me to say Thomas, the doubter, but no. I'm going to show you today that he is more than just a doubter, although all the disciples were, and at one point all of us were, but he is a very loyal apostle. And as we continue to study the life of the apostles, we can't help but notice that Every one of them were pretty insignificant. Every one of them. They were unimportant. They were unimpressive. It's kind of funny how the Apostle Paul, when he's talking to the church in Corinth, he says, look around and see if there are any mighty, any noble, anyone who is impressive, anyone who has any type of pedigree. Like, there's very few. And so they were just like us. They were just like us. They were common people like you and I. And it's just those people who would humble themselves that the Lord desires to use greatly for his own glory and his own name. So if someone here today says, well, I'm a nobody. God can never use me. You're the perfect candidate. It's the people who think they're somebody. It's the people who think they're something that the Lord says, well, can't use you until you learn a little lesson on humility. Right? They were in a sense, society's runt of the litter. They were not the religious pedigree like Pharisees and scribes. Again, they were fishermen. They were common tradesmen. They were tax collectors. Once again, the Lord delights in saving and using nobodies for his glory. And as I'm going through the study of these men's lives, I'm reminded that if God can save them, if God can grow them, and that if God can use them, these 12 imperfect men, then God can use me. And God can use you. So far, we've covered Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, and Bartholomew. Today, as you can see, we'll be covering Matthew, the tax collector, and Thomas, the loyal. So we're going to begin with Matthew, the tax collector. He's the seventh apostle on the list, found in Mark chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. He's the seventh guy. Seven is a good number, biblically speaking. Matthew was known by two names. He was known by Levi and he was known by Matthew, Levi, the son of Alphaeus and Matthew. Now, the name Levi means united or joined. And it was his birth name. And most likely it was a tribal name. This could very well be pointed to the fact that possibly Levi was was from the tribe of Levi. And as you know, Levi, one of the patriarchs, is the son of Jacob, also known as Israel. He's the third son. So it could very well be that Levi here is from the tribe that Moses, Aaron, and John the Baptist is from, the tribe of Levi. So his name could be a tribal name. His second name is Matthew, which means gift of God. Gift of God. And was either a name that Levi gave himself or a name that Jesus gave him. We know that Jesus likes to give disciples names. As you know, James and John were given the names Boenerges. It's a possibility that Jesus gave Matthew this name to remind him of his new nature, a gift of God. The Bible doesn't say necessarily, but it's a possibility that either he gave himself a new name because he's got a new nature. He's a new man or Jesus gave him this new name. The name Levi, in one sense, in one sense means a curse to the people seeing that he was a dishonest tax collector that people dreaded, but now he is Matthew, a gift of God, therefore a blessing to the people. As he went from stealing from the people to eventually giving to the people. What did he give them? The Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew. By the way, church history says that the book of Matthew is the most popular uh, gospel of the four. That it was the book that the Jews loved to read and study more than the others. I love them all the same, but for some reason, that was their favorite. And so again, Matthew went from stealing from people as a tax collector to giving to people. So he really did become Matthew, a gift from God. Again, he went from being a curse to being a blessing. A curse in the sense that he was a thief. He was an extortioner. This is the power of God, church. 
Anytime that God takes someone who is stealing, lying, murdering like Paul, and turns that individual into one who is an all-out disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, one who now loves, one who now lays down their life, one who is now willing to humble themselves in the presence of all, one who is willing to be a servant of all, right? That could only be done by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one of the main points here today, is that God can turn a wretch like Levi into a blessing like Matthew, a gift of God. Matthew was from Capernaum in the region of Galilee, as found in Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 17, and was, as you know, the writer of the book of Matthew, the very first gospel, the very first book in the New Testament. I mean, this is a big deal. Here's a guy that went from cheating people to writing the book of Matthew. It's wonderful. Since we already read the account of Matthew, his encounter with Jesus in Mark chapter 2, we're going to go ahead and read out of Matthew 9, 9 to 13. So if you can open your Bibles to Matthew 9, we're going to read verses 9 to 13. Let us read there verse 9 to 13. As Jesus passed on from there, He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house, Mark tells us this was Levi's house, that behold, now Matthew writes that word behold because this was very surprising. This was unusual. This was a sight to see. Because, of course, you would never see the Pharisees and the scribes in this position. Let's keep reading. Many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What a beautiful scene. This is the encounter that Matthew had with the Lord Jesus Christ. One thing I noticed about Mark is that Mark uses Matthew's old name, Levi. In the book of Mark, in chapter 2, he uses the old name Levi. But here in Matthew, Matthew uses his new name, Matthew. Right here in Matthew in chapter 9, in verse 9. Which most likely means that Matthew wants to be called by his apostle, new life in Christ's name, and not his old tax collector name. And I don't blame him. He writes this book, he puts his new name down, And I think each and every one of us desire the same thing, don't we? You and I don't want to be recognized as the old man when we see some old friends. We want people to see the new nature in us. And I think that's the reason why he put his name Matthew there, a gift of God. We don't want people to remember the old wretch unless they remember it for the purpose that God saved us and changed us and made us new. So it just serves as a testimony. It says here that Jesus saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. Here we see Jesus' compassion. Jesus saw Levi, not with eyes of disdain, because it also says that the Pharisees saw what was going on and they grumbled about it. It bothered them to see that Jesus was hanging out without caste. But it says that Jesus saw Levi, and this wasn't again with eyes of Disdain, like, look at that worthless cheat. These are the eyes or stares and looks that Levi was used to. That's the way he was looked upon everywhere he went. Look, there he goes, Levi, the cheat. Untrustworthy tax collector. Keep him away from our house. But today, the most important eyes would look at him with compassion and call upon him to turn from his sin and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to be a part of his mission. What a beautiful scene. 
When the Pharisees saw men like Levi, they would speak evil of them. They would think lowly of them. They wouldn't want these men a part of their camp. These are the last guys we're going to pick to work with us, but not the Lord Jesus. The Lord saw him for what he will make of him, and he brought him near. The Lord saw him with eyes of compassion. Now, tax collectors were some of the most hated men. Tax collectors were basically the bottom of the barrel. They were the scum of the earth. Nobody liked them. Nobody wanted to be around them. The only ones that wanted to be around them were men just like them. Thieves, hanging out with thieves and enjoying each other's company. But nobody else liked them. People who had some type of um, religious common sense stayed away from them. They were seen as no better than prostitutes and drunks and other low, degrading, sinful lifestyles. Tax collector was a synonym for sinner. So anytime somebody wanted to disrespect someone, they would just call them a tax collector. Today we got different names to bring people down, but back then it was like calling them a sinner. It was like calling the person worthless, thief, liar, cheat, tax collector, sinner. This would be the equivalent of Jesus calling a bank robber to drop the bag and follow him. Listen, while he's running out of the bank. That's basically what's happening here. This man is sitting at his office. He's cheating the people in real time. And Jesus says, hey, stop what you're doing. Follow me. Didn't even say stop what you're doing. He just said follow me. And that alone would stop what he's doing. The man gets up and he follows the Lord Jesus. It would be the equivalent of, of the Lord Jesus coming to a prostitute who's about to go into the next hotel room. And at that moment, the Lord says, follow me. She drops the dude. She drops the sex client and follows the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking at. A radical commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ to follow him and to drop the sin that we're committing. And so this is a, a pretty awesome thing. And that's the reason why he says, behold, these are the kinds of people that the Pharisees just completely stayed away from. These are the kind of people that the Pharisees thought had no hope. These are the kinds of people that the Pharisees would think they would never, ever in a million years get into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And then God puts on human flesh and he shows these Pharisees what it really means to love. And he goes after the ones that they hated. This was extremely radical. And that's why the Pharisees hated Jesus. Why? Because Jesus actually loved the sinner. Didn't pretend to love the sinner like the Pharisees and the scribes. He actually loved them right where they are. And he would call them to newness of life. He loved them too much to leave them there, right? If he left them there, they would die in their sin and go to hell. He loved them too much. He said, follow me. And in following the Lord Jesus Christ, you get forgiveness, you get newness of life, you get adoption, you get eternal life, you get the Lord Jesus Christ, you get to sit at the right hand of the Father with the Lord Jesus Christ, you get the whole package. But you got to drop what you're doing and follow Him. You got to drop what you're doing and what you believe, trusting in your own righteousness, your own goodness, your own ways, the ways of the world, drop it all, follow Jesus, and you will be saved. What a wonderful thing. So these were men who were hated. The tax collectors were viewed as traitors and defectors by the Jews because these Jewish men like Levi worked for the Roman government and were given the green light to overtax the people. And so then they would go to their own people and they would add some extra dollars to those taxes. And sometimes they would add a whole lot. And that's how these tax collectors got rich. How did Levi get rich? How did uh, Zacchaeus get rich? By ripping people off, by ripping people off. That big table that everybody was sitting around, that was in a sense a stolen table. The house that everybody was enjoying was in a sense a stolen house, only because people were ripped off in order for him to get the things that he has. The Lord knew all that, and he was still there, full of mercy and grace to save this sinner. It's extremely radical. Tax collectors were banned from the temple. 
I mean, the temple is the holiest place there in Israel at the time in Jerusalem. And these tax collectors were not allowed. They weren't allowed. They weren't allowed into public worship. They had to stay outside. They weren't allowed into the synagogues or the Jewish churches. They were seen as social lepers or public pariahs. Nobody wanted to be around their teeth because they bite hard. And so people, again, they just stayed away from them. The passage says, and he, speaking of Jesus, said to, them, to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. By the way, Luke chapter 5 and verse 28 says, so he, speaking of Levi, left all, rose up and followed after him. He left all to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to understand that this is so radical that he left his livelihood. He dropped a bag of money, followed the Lord Jesus Christ. At that time, there were tax collectors always looking for little franchises like the one Matthew had. And so as soon as he got off that chair and walked away, somebody else filled it. Quickly, these people were in line to get rich quick. Right. This was the get rich quick scheme of Jerusalem. And so he dropped it. He dropped his his wicked business and he followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Levi must have heard from John the Baptist, as you know, John the Baptist was preaching in Israel. And Matthew was not far away. He heard about John the Baptist's message. Tax collectors would come to John the Baptist while he was baptizing there in the Jordan River. And the, the tax collectors would ask, what must we do to be baptized? And then he would say, don't take more than you should. They were thieves. And so here we see again that Levi must have heard about John the Baptist. Levi most likely heard the voice and the teaching and the words of Jesus with his own two ears. And I believe that at this point, his heart was most likely already convicted. And it's a possibility that he was already being wooed by the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe for the forgiveness of sin. I'm sure Levi thought, I'm a great sinner. There's someone in town. They say he's the Messiah and that he's the only one who can forgive me of my sin. And here comes the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, follow me. You think uh, Levi doesn't know what that means? He's going to get his sin forgiven. He's going to live guilt free. He's going to live shame free in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the reason why he got up and left. Why? Because money can't buy forgiveness. There is not a better feeling in all the world than to be forgiven of all your sin. I've tasted many things. I've done many stupid things. And nothing compares with the sense and the joy that one feels to be free from their sin and forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ now and forever. There is nothing like it. Could it be that he heard this message and said, man, here comes the forgiver. Could it be that he had such a overactive conscience? Thinking of the people that he's ripped off so many years, so many times. Finally, there's someone who actually cares. Someone who can actually do something for this poor guy. This was no doubt radical repentance. Levi quit cold turkey. And abandoned his sinful, get-rich-quick scheme and greedy business for Jesus. By the way, this again is what repentance looks like. You drop the sin that you're doing and committing. You drop your own belief system. You drop the belief systems of the world. And you follow the Lord Jesus Christ. It's what it means to truly repent of your sin. It's a change of mind that produces a change of life. You trade your way of thinking for the way Jesus thinks. You trade your way of speaking for the way Jesus speaks. You trade your way of walking and talking for the way Jesus walks and talks. It's a complete exchange. His life for yours. That's repentance. And so he dropped what he was doing and he followed the Lord Jesus Christ. This was very, very, very radical. The question is, have you repented? Have you repented? Turn from your sin. 
And even as a believer, do you still turn from your sin? We ought to be. We ought to be if we are called disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we've heard the command, follow me. Follow me. This is so exclusive. It's like follow me only. Follow me. The Lord calls everyone to follow him. Are you following him? I hope you are. It would be a waste of eternity if you choose not to. Levi invited Jesus to his house for dinner, which was again most likely a very large house, seeing that many sinners and tax collectors came and sat down with Jesus. This was a really big house. Levi slash Matthew was already trying to connect Jesus with his sinful friends. This was an evangelistic dinner party. Um, Levi was ecstatic. He was in awe that there would be a man who is the Messiah and would be willing to take in a sinner like him. He was in awe and he said, hey, there's more of me. And, and there's some of them who I think would appreciate what you did for me. Come to my house. Let me introduce you to them. I couldn't go to the Pharisees and the scribes for this. I can come to you. The Lord goes to his house. He sits down and eats dinner with a, a pack of sinners. And the Pharisees hated it. But I believe the Lord Jesus was enjoying himself in one sense. He was after their hearts. He was after their hearts. I remember when the Lord first saved me. I had this routine of going to a certain friend's house with his buddies and just get high, like really high. And I remember going there one time after I was redeemed, I was changed, I was saved. I just knew something was different because the desire to do what they were doing was gone. So anyway, I go over there and they're all there hanging out. I met with them a couple times until they didn't want me over anymore. <laughs> but anyway, so I go over there. I'm, you know, they think I'm going to do what I always do. I get there. I sit down. They're passing the joint. I, I nope, don't want it. And so it's my opportunity. I'm excited. I sense the forgiveness of God. I, I sense that something new happened to me. I have to share it with these folks, right? These are my friends. These are the tax collectors in my life. And so I sit down. I start telling them about what the Lord had done for me. I started telling them that the Lord Jesus Christ saved me from hell and he could do the same for them. I started telling them that he has the power to give us a new life and to give us a power over this sin. Some of them, you know, you know, smoking and talking to me and stuff and listening to me. They were uncomfortable. I think I blew their high. I did it more than once, I'm sure. But, um, but I remember being so excited and wanting to go after those that I was closest to. And there's another friend of mine who lived down the street. I went to his house. I took some Christian music with me. I was so excited. This was all new to me to some degree. I mean, I grew up in the church, but not really, if you know what I mean. The devils grow up in the church, too. But anyway, so I went to his house. I'm excited. He's got a really cool truck with a loud system. I go to his house. I pop in the music. I'm thinking he's going to be blown away. And I'm just so excited. And he's just like, what is this? And I'm just like, listen, listen to the words. And it was about God's majesty and God's forgiveness. And at least he took the time to hear me out. But, but that's what happens. When you're truly born again, you want others to be born again. And sometimes that first love dwindles. Sometimes it goes away because the Christian at times can even become worldly and disconnected and cold. But in the beginning, there's a flame that you got to keep alive, right? And if that flame has been put out for any reason, I say, get it sparked up again. And God has been good. He has saved some of my friends I hung out with in the past. And my friend Javi here is one of them. And so I know that the Lord has the power to save and to deliver those that we think um, may never come to him, right? I kind of know exactly how Matthew felt. It's kind of embarrassing to share a little bit of my past, but hey. We're all saved from sin, right? All of us. There is no one here that has not sinned against the Lord. There is no one here that doesn't have a story about the goodness and the mercies of God. It goes on to say in these passages, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? While the answer is clear, in order to help them see their sin sick souls, right? 
How is he going to help them to see their need for forgiveness and newness of life if, if he doesn't hang out with them at all? And so he's there to call them to repentance and salvation. How will we ever win a, an unsaved world if we avoid them? I, I think it's a, a detriment to the body of Christ for Christians to get saved and then never go back into the world and try to win somebody for Jesus. There are far too many people who get cozy and comfortable in this place. You are called to be fishers of men. Win somebody for Christ. He says, therefore, I did not call the righteous, the self-righteous that is, but sinners to repentance. Jesus was basically saying that he will save those who recognize their need for salvation. Who recognize their need for a brand new heart. I've been ministering to an old friend lately and uh, her and her husband and uh, they text me yesterday and they say, we get it. We get it now. They're going through a bunch of drama. We get it now. We need new hearts, they tell me. I'm like, you need new hearts. You, you guys cannot go through this marriage in victory without new hearts. In other words, a doctor doesn't help well or healthy patients, but sick patients. And Levi, along with his buddies, knew they were sick with sin. And that's why the Lord told the Pharisees, in one sense, I didn't come to save you because you think you don't need saving. You're well, you're healthy, quote unquote. But these people, they're dying in their sin and they know it. So I'm going to help them. One of the worst things would be to know you're dying in your sin and you don't go to the doctor. Many like to argue that Jesus ate with sinners. Yes, he ate with them. I've had some friends tell me in the past, well, I'm hanging out with so-and-so and we're just drinking a little and doing a little bit of this and that. I mean, Jesus hung out with his buddies, with unbelievers, didn't he? Tax collectors and sinners. I think one thing we need to understand is that yes, he... Spend time with them, but he didn't party with them. He was calling them to what? Repentance. That's what the passage says in Matthew 9, 13. But sinners to repentance. What was Jesus saying at that gigantic dinner table? Tax collectors. All of you need to turn from your evil ways and follow me. All of you need a change of mind and a change of life. And so we cannot justify that desire to be worldly. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Amen. Jesus, when he was around sinners, it was to save them. Don't argue that. I'll just hang out with my old friends and continue to do those old things. No, you are called to be different. You have been regenerated, made new, new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. New. What, what is this newness? This newness is the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord helps us in that area. And we become more and more sanctified as we surrender to his word. Some stories say that Matthew eventually preached in Persia. That is modern day Iran. And Syria. These are two of Israel's worst enemies at this time, Iran and Syria. Church history says that he went to Ethiopia and that he brought the good news to kings. This was a man that was robbing people in broad daylight to go into different countries to bring the gospel and stand before kings. What is the Lord not able to do with the sinner? And church history also says there are different accounts. For sure, he died for the Lord. So he was martyred for Christ. He was killed for his faith. The last thing I'm going to say about Levi is this. And Thomas is shorter than Levi, by the way. You are going home today. <laughs> Levi slash Matthew serves as an example of God's mercy again. And willingness to save the worst of the worst. In 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul tells Timothy, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. He's talking to a young pastor. 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. What is the one of the main purposes of Jesus coming to this earth is to save sinners. Jesus says in John 3 that sinners are already condemned. He didn't come to condemn. He came to save. He came to bring them out of condemnation and into glory and into grace and into salvation. Amen. And so basically, again, Matthew, Paul, they serve as examples of how God can save the worst of the worst. The one you think that the Lord could never reach and never save and would never want to. That's exactly the one that the Lord wants to save. God desires that none should perish. Not even men like Matthew or Paul or your crazy friend. Or you, if you're here today without Christ. Let us turn our attention now to Thomas the Loyal. Again, unfortunately, Thomas is uh, commonly known as Doubting Thomas. But in all reality, all the disciples were hard-headed at times and doubting, doubtful. And the Lord would tell them many times, right? Rebuke them. Oh, heart of hearing. Oh, you of little faith. Over and over. What's wrong with you guys? What do you got in that noggin of yours, right? I think it would be best to call him Thomas the Loyal. And we're going to see the reasons why in a minute. Briefly, just some general information about Thomas. Thomas is known by two names. Thomas, obviously, in the Hebrew, it means twin or lookalike. And he was also known as Didymus, which was really just the translation of Thomas. Didymus is the Greek word for twin. So in Spanish, you and I would call him cuate, right? We say, ¿Qué onda cuate? Some scholars believe that Thomas had a twin brother or sister. The Bible doesn't say necessarily. Some have said that Thomas resembled. He looked like, that's his name, Thomas Didymus, looked like. He looked like Jesus and therefore was nicknamed Didymus, but we are not sure. We're going to see that in every scene we're about to read briefly, Thomas is not marked by doubt necessarily. He is marked by loyalty. Loyalty. I mean, it's, it's a bad thing when people remember the worst part of you, right? And they name you that. It's, it's horrible. Like, what about the good things that Thomas has done for the Lord, right? Ay, ay, ay. Be kind to one another. Um, let us read here John 11, 11, 16. John eleven sixteen. 16. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Do you hear that deep loyalty in Thomas's words? He says, let us go and die with him. We have to understand that Thomas does not want to leave Jesus' side. You, you can hear the bravery in his voice there. And the loyalty. Here's the background and the context of Thomas's bold, I would say extremely bold statement. In chapter 10, the religious Jews wanted to stone Jesus to death. And the reason why was because he claimed to be one with the Father. In other words, he claimed to be divine or to be equal with God the Father. And the Pharisees knew that and so they wanted to stone him to death. And they tried to arrest him. And so at that moment, what the Lord Jesus did was he escaped and he went to the Jordan River where John the Baptist started his ministry to get away from the Pharisees. Well, it turns out that in John chapter 11, his really good friend Lazarus dies. Jesus decides he's going to go and he's going to raise him from the dead. The only problem is that Lazarus lives in Bethany. Bethany is extremely close to Jerusalem where the Pharisees are, where the men who want to kill him are. Thomas knows that. And so Thomas is, you know, they're kind of uh, trying to change the Lord's mind. Are you sure you want to go back into the lion's mouth? I mean, these guys are still there. They want to kill you. I don't know if this is a good idea. And as, as you know, the Lord is. We have Thomas here who understood that this trip could be extremely dangerous. And so he says there, let us also go that we may die with him. So in a sense, Thomas had a ride or die personality, if you will. He had a ride or die kind of 
commitment and loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, even though there's a hint of pessimism in Thomas's words, John MacArthur says that he's Eeyore of Winnie the Pooh. And so you can kind of hear him say this possibly in that voice or maybe not. Maybe not. Nonetheless, Thomas couldn't live without Jesus. He would rather die with Jesus than to be away from Jesus and in his mind for Jesus to be killed in Bethany. Do you see how Thomas did not want to be disconnected from the Lord? Wherever the Lord goes, I'll go. And if they decide to kill him, I am dying with him. That's not doubt. Might be a little bit of pessimism, but to me, that sounds like loyalty. Let's go, boys. Let's man up. I mean, someone who was a little more positive would have just said, the Lord is with us. He'll protect us. You know, but Thomas wasn't that type. That's okay. He was a little pessimistic. That's all right. But he was brave. He was courageous. He says, if we got to die, let's go die with him. Those are the kind of people you want in your circle. Let us read um, John 14, 1 to 6. Remember, we're looking for loyalty in these scenes and in his words. The Lord is speaking, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. There's that equality with the Father. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, this is a promise for you, church. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And then Thomas opens his mouth. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. Probably said it like that. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you see again the deep loyalty that Thomas had for the Lord. Thomas doesn't want again to leave the Lord's side. Not when Jesus' life was in his mind in danger and not now. Where are you going? The Lord is telling him, look, I'm, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm, he's alluding to the cross. He's, he's going to go to glory. He's going to be with his father in heaven. He's going to prepare a place for Thomas and the disciples. And, and Thomas is just, wait, wait a minute. Wait, what? You're leaving us? You're going away? I'm convinced that Thomas loved Jesus like John the Apostle did. As I'm paying closer attention to Thomas's words, I'm convinced that Thomas was Jesus's chicle. He was his gum. Wherever Jesus goes, I want to go. Whether it's to death or to heaven, wherever you go, I want to go. Listen to me, that's a heart that is glued to the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope that you possess that heart. Because there is nothing better. The background again, Jesus is telling him, look, I'm going. I'm going to glory. The beautiful thing about that is that Thomas's loyal heart and question gave us the awesome and famous answer from Jesus. He says, I am the way. Thank you for asking, Thomas. How do we get to heaven? Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. What does that mean? Anyone who is not in Jesus is out of the way, going to hell. It's called the broad road. He's the only way. He's the door of heaven, if you will. No one gets in but through him. It's also to say that if anyone is not in Christ, they are living a lie and in a lie because he is the truth. Exclusively, like absolute truth. And anyone who thinks they're alive apart from Christ is actually dead in their sin. They exist, but there is no life in them. 
They have breath, but it's not the Holy Spirit. Do you get what I'm saying? And so the Lord tells them, listen, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. Do you want to know how to get there? Through me. You need to have a relationship with me. You need to bow to me. You need to follow me. You need to love me, and I'll get you there. I will get you there. I am the way. In other words, he's the road you walk on. You walk on any other path, and you're going to destruction. He's the truth you believe. Every word, every line, everything that he is, everything that he's done, everything that he's commanded, everything that he said is absolute truth. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for asking. What a beautiful and powerful passage that is, right? The Lord didn't say you got to go to this denomination over here. or You got to go to this one local church over here. You got to go to this one guy over here. You got to read this one book on the shelf over there. It's not to say that the church isn't important and God's people aren't important. But it's through Jesus Christ alone that we get to heaven. Amen. Everyone else is just a blessing on the trip. <laughs> if they're a blessing on the trip, if you know what I mean. But anyway, it's through Christ, church. That's how we get there. He's a doorway to heaven. A genuine relationship with me, Jesus is saying, is the road to eternal glory. Let us read John chapter 20, verse 19 to 29, and we'll be closing up in about an hour. <clears throat> this is where the poor guy got his name, his nickname, Doubting Thomas. But I see more. I see more than just doubting here. Verse 19. Then the same day at evening... Being the first day of the week, which is Sunday, that's where we gather on Sunday because Jesus rose on Sunday and that's when they started gathering. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. What an amazing moment, right? The doors are shut. There's no way in. And the Lord just miraculously appears in this room. That's what the glorious body can do. 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Kind of reminds you of Genesis, right? When, when Yahweh breathed into the nostrils of Adam. 23, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So in other words, it's through their leadership and their writing in which people can know for sure if their sins are forgiven or not. It's through their ministry work. It says here, now Thomas called the twin, el cuate, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. That right there is supposed to be breathtaking news. Because Thomas probably wants to see the Lord more than all of them put together. In my opinion. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails... And put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side. I will not believe. I guess that's where Eeyore comes in, right? 26. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside. So eight days later, they're gathered together again. And Thomas with them. This time he's with them. But the first time he wasn't. Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, so he does the same thing again. Doors are shut, no way in, he just appears miraculously. Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas. I love this because the Lord came to bless him. Because he wasn't there for the first blessing, so the Lord comes for him. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. By the way, I don't think that Thomas reached out and touched him. I think he was like, oh, it's you. <laughs> like, put your finger down, dude. It's Jesus, right? I think he was just 
flabbergasted, if you will. And so Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you believe. This is a verse for us, folks. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You have not seen the Lord Jesus with your physical eyes. If you have, <clears throat> check your eyes or you're into some serious trouble. It's not him. We see him through eyes of faith, through the writings of Scripture. And he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet they believe. But what does he say? My Lord and my God. I mean, the revelation at this point is at its peak. Rabbi, mm, too low of a word. Teacher, too, too low. Lord, master, ruler, governor of the universe, God, creator, omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, creator of all things, self-sustaining, self-sufficient, God. I could just imagine. The rest of the guys were like, why didn't we say that? We saw him first. You need to understand a little something about Thomas. Thomas was loyal to the core. That's why he called him Lord and God. There are no words that are connected to loyalty that can exceed Lord and God. Nothing. Did he struggle a little bit with doubt? Yeah. Oh, but he made it up with Lord and God. My Lord and my God. Very personal too. Like these guys are all here. Cool. No big deal. But you're... All mine, you're my Lord and my God. I love Thomas. He loved the Lord deeply. I think more than we know. What's very interesting in verse 24, when Jesus came, Thomas wasn't present. The first time. And I believe that the reason why was because, again, this is telling of Thomas's loyalty. I believe that Thomas just wanted to be left alone. He was so hurt. He was so overwhelmed. I mean, honestly, I believe that he was totally broken and he was in the deepest pit of depression at this point. Jesus, whom he saw as his Lord and his God, his closest friend, his rabbi, his comforter, the one who gave him new life and forgiveness. He is gone in his mind. He wasn't there on purpose. He was too hurt to show up. And doesn't that happen? At times, funeral, where's so-and-so? He didn't come. Why? Because he can't come. He's hurting. Hurting more than all of us. He can't be here. Couldn't make it. Didn't show up. That was Thomas. I believe that's telling of Thomas's loyalty. He loved Jesus more than our minds can fathom. And now Jesus was dead. In his mind, he was still dead in his mind. And what he feared the most came to pass. Thomas was separated from Jesus for the first time in three and a half years. You remember in the beginning, I'm not going to leave his side. I'll die with him. Remember when the Lord said he's going to go to heaven? Hey, how do we get there? And now finally, the Lord is no longer in the picture. And Thomas is just like, what happened here? I believe that his world was shaken, rocked to the core. That's why he didn't show up. He couldn't put a fake smile on his face. He couldn't chill with the, the other apostle buddies of his and have a good time or even weep with them. He needed to be all by himself with no one watching. His love was so deep that he needed to weep all alone. And then after eight days, after rivers of tears, finally comes to the, the disciples and that's when the Lord Jesus shows up. The Lord tells Thomas directly, touch me. Go ahead. It's your request, right? It's what you said when I wasn't around, I heard you. The Lord wasn't there physically present when Thomas said it the first time. I got to see him and I got to touch him and I got to put my finger in his side. But the Lord, omniscient, all knowing, he heard him. Wherever the Lord was, he heard his words. And he goes straight to Thomas and he says, here you go, buddy. I'm right here. 
in the flesh, risen. Again, I believe that Thomas was a ride-or-die disciple, to use modern language. He was all in. He was all in from the beginning, willing to die. Did he doubt? Yes. Did he understand everything? No. But he did not want to leave Jesus' side, not for a second. I hope you're not distant from the Lord. I hope you are close to him always. The Lord says, abide in me. You know what he's saying? Make me your house. Make me your house. The Lord says, I'll be your house. Abide in me. Stay connected to the Lord Jesus always. Stay close to him. It's, it's a matter of the will. It's a matter of the will. We will connect with the things we want. If you want Jesus, connect with him. There are far too many people who have too many excuses. They don't work with me. I know how much he's worth. And I know the things that we chase after our time are worthless. So let's get at him. Let's go for him. Amen. Thomas didn't write none of the New Testament books, no letters. But church history says that he evangelized India and that he founded the first church there or one of the first churches there. Thomas was burned alive. He was burned at the stake. And they said that they drove a spear through his side. Interestingly enough, that's what that's what he wanted to touch. Right. The, the scar where Jesus had the spear driven to his heart. And that's the way Thomas died. He took a spear to the side like his Lord. He died for Jesus. Pretty awesome.